So thank you for joining our session today on advanced functionality tips and tricks learned from working with our customers, also known as, sure, we could do that. I'm Dan Reichert, Senior Sales Engineer with Sumo, and with me is Ryan Johnson, Sales Engineering Manager for Asia Pacific and Japan. Now, anyone who's ever been a sales engineer in their career knows you should never say yes to just about everything the customer asks for. It's one of the few rules of the role. Um, if anything, you want to do it to keep your product and engineering from hating you too much and also keep your customers from hating you from overpromising. But it's literally impossible to have every single feature um, a customer wants and you need to know when to say no. But while we can't support every single feature out there, um, we can come very close to providing virtually the same value that you're looking for with a versatile tool like Sumo. Um, many of you have experience with Sumo already and you know that it's a very flexible tool. Everything we'll be covering should be functionalities and features that you all have access to as a, as a Sumo customer already. But today we're going to go over ways that we broke the rule and we told some of you, I'm almost positive we could do that. Just give me some time and let's see what we could do. So I'm Dan Reichert and I've been with Sumo since August 2016. I joined when I was one of three mid-market sales engineers, our, our smaller teams. But our team, team was generally new and I came to speed really quickly, not only from my desire to learn all these innovative technologies that you all are using, but also a lot of the groundwork some of my predecessors and people like Ryan was able to do for me uh, before I joined. But academically, I studied InfoSec and information management and um, passion brought me to professional services with IBM QRadar. And um, after that, I worked another job or two, but I ended up over here at Sumo. And you know, I couldn't be happier in, in this career that I'm doing now, basically bringing together my InfoSec and uh, information management skills all into one and I'm actually very um, fortunate that I'm able to have a career in um, both of my, my, my degrees. But outside of work I'm just your average tech nerd that likes craft beer and beards um, and I like woodworking on the side so I guess it's not exactly that I like new technology, I, like it, I guess I just like making solutions out of technology from any century that's out there. Ryan? Yeah, cool. Oh, so um, hi, Ryan Johnson. Um, I look after the technical field team out of uh, India, New Zealand, Japan, and Australia. Um, so wide area, about 10 of us. Um, I've been playing in this space for probably, in the logging space, for probably about 10, 11 years. Monitoring, troubleshooting for about 20 odd. I used to have hair. Um, as set up there, I recently got an IMD big credit as a business zombie. <laughs> Look it up. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm loving my Sumo journey um, and I like making the platform do things that it was never designed to do, which we're going to show you a little bit about shortly. So when you leave this session today, there's three things we primarily want you, want you to take away with you. First, think outside the docs. What does this mean? Well, we're not saying to ignore those docs altogether. They're great. But what we're saying is just because we don't have certain functionality documented, it doesn't mean it's not possible. Our product team and our engineers, they are going to create all this different functionality for you with certain use cases in mind. But when it gets out there in the wild, sky's the limit for what it could do. Um, experiment. See if you could put a subquery into a search template. What's going to happen? Second, build it. Get creative. If you're theorizing some sort of desired functionality, see if you could develop it. Uh, see if you could hack something together, Wor uh, work with our APIs that are ever expanding and growing that are going to really help out these capabilities to come up with all this new functionality. You're never going to know if it works if you don't try. And finally, give Sumo some feedback. There's many ways that, that we listen to our customers. I'm not in product, but some of our product managers could tell you that they love hearing from you of what's working, what isn't working, what could be improved upon. Go to our idea portal and submit some ideas in there. File support tickets. Work with your reps. Let them know all, all of your feedback on this. Um, but this is how we're going to continue to provide you uh, the best tool on the market. Exactly right. So we're going to be covering a variety of different operators today um, in this session. They're going to range from simple parse expressions to complex subqueries. The more intermediate and advanced ones are going to be listed up here that we're going to go through a few of them um, for the next couple minutes. But do you really need to know a lot of these different operators and functionalities for the session to be useful? No. Um, we're not exactly here to, to teach you do this, do this, and do that, and you're gonna, it's going to work exactly as is. It's not like 
the hands-on. It's just more to give you ideas and inspire you to come up with these different ideas out there. Now, a quick review of these. We're going to start off with search templates. They're probably one of the most covered topics in this session. We're, um, basically, search templates are those in-betweens between your query language and your dashboards. Uh, they're great for power users. They're very easy to use, and they've led to a few different solutions that we're going to go over. The next are the regexware, or as Ryan likes to say, regexware. Correctly. I will say regex yeah. correctly. <laughs> very few of you know that, that there's more than just one or two ways to do a where statement. Even fewer know that you could put a regular expression in there as well. But um, what you're essentially going to do to use regular expressions in your where statement is you're going to do a, uh, you're going to do where field matches, and then you just encapsulate your regular expression in forward slashes, or yeah, that way. <laughs> um, but basically, once you figure that out and you get it working, it's going to drastically expand your ability to filter down your your messages as needed. Now. Scheduled views, they've been around as long as I've been with Sumo, probably as long as Ryan's been with it. You probably know True. better than I do about how long they've been here. But they're essentially going to be very powerful for optimizing your queries. They're basically constantly running a, running a query, and they're storing their aggregate results in an, in an index. So instead of searching across and looking across gigabytes or terabytes versus of raw logs and getting those results, you're only looking at a couple kilobytes or megabytes versus of those aggregate results. And then finally, subqueries. They're going to be one of the newest operators and probably one of the most advanced ones that we're going to be going over in the session. They're effectively going to give you advanced capabilities to correlate your data. Now, few of you that have tried them or looked into them, they look intimidating. Not going to lie, they're a little bit difficult to grasp at first, but once you figure them out, they're really awesome. You can do all kinds of different things. Um, and they're, um, you know, basically what's going on with them is you have the, the child query that's running, and it's going to feed those, those results into a parent query. Just figure out that syntax, and everything is just going to click and be pretty simple to follow at that point. But set the stage a bit and get a little bit more training. I'm going to pass it over to Ryan. Thanks. Cool. Rightio. So Dan's going to cover off a lot of the hands-on um, approaches to using a query syntax. I'm going to start, kind of take a step back and be a bit more practical to start with. Swap you. Yep. So we're going to take a quick trip outside the box. So one, as kind of Dan started with, one of the things we're tasked with is finding interesting solutions to interesting problems that you probably won't read about in the documentation. So I'll start with one that is an internal one. Now, in the field te technical field team, professional services, sales engineering, uh, trainers, um, field tech, uh, support staff, we have um, a lot of tribal knowledge. So we've got to understand, what's the best way we can share this? And we've tried many different ways. Like, it could be Slack, it could be email, it could be sessions like these. But how to best kind of socialize the skills to lift everybody up? So I'll start with one. Let's start with an idea. Um, one of the things that I've done over my time at Sumo is occasionally write these emails called fun with. It could be fun with regex, fun with queries, fun with dashboards. And there's a few examples you see up there. I mean, um, I look after the Japan team and I had to figure out how we, our um, dashboards could display double byte characters in kanji so it would be a bit more. It's stuff that I would never thought I would have to figure out. But how can we share this? Now sharing in Sumo is cool, so there's the emoji used here. Email, I hate email. <laughs> I hate email with the passion of a thousand sons. Um, but it's been useful so far where we had to send someone a write up of a query and get them to control C, control V, change a few things. but there's got to be a better way. Pow. There we go. Old operators. New tricks. It's time to rethink what an operator can do. Maybe outside the boundaries of what the documentation says or how we need to see it. And rethinking what an app or a dashboard can be. I love this quote. Um, David's actually wandering around here somewhere. He, um, in response to one of our um, PS guys creating a query to determine DNS entropy, so bad DNS entries, he replied back with those, I always warn developers working on search language operators that they will never be able to fully anticipate all the uses that solution engineers will find for them. But then he linked to a YouTube video of some guy husking a corn kernel with a motorbike. I don't know how to take that, but, um, <laughs> but, but this kind of got me thinking. 
Now, a dashboard we traditionally use as a, well, let's show you some graphs and dashboards, but what if we could use them as an education tool? Let's go over here. So I started writing up these um, write-ups in a dashboard using real data that people could click through. And this is actually a real dashboard, so you know, I can scroll here, it's, it's actually a Sumo dashboard, and it gives users the ability to kind of go through, understand the use cases, how to apply these things, drill down to understand how they were used. So this is just a walkthrough on how to use Pars Multi, which is a obscenely powerful operator, way beyond what our document actually can say. Then I kind of went down the other path of like, well, here's some interesting use cases. How can we fill missing values with the last observed value? Which, um, for the, some of the advanced users in the room, you're probably thinking, I've had to try to do that before, but couldn't figure out how. And we've kind of had to come, come away with a way to do this. Or even more advanced kind of, almost kind of show off things, really. It's like, how do I detect, detect spear phishing? Now, who knew there was a thing called homographs and homoglyphs? Because I certainly didn't. Now, this is where you can detect um, potentially malicious domains based on character substitutions. So, for instance, here's a little trick for you. See this little C here, Sumo Logic. Sorry if it's not too big. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. That little C you see right there. I'm going to get out of editing mode. <laughs> now, if I search for this, search for C, that ain't a C. That is a Cyrillic S. Dun, dun, dun. Evil people send you through domains. And you can apply this to DNS lookups, etc., etc. So that's how we started sharing these things. And it got a lot more buy-in and users click on the queries and actually kind of work through, work through in comments. But with the advent of search templates, that meant new possibilities. So in search templates, what we do is we actually take any component of a query and we, we let the user specify what that should be before we treat it as a query. So we're going to take this education concept just a step further. This is, you know, a, we're essentially turning the concept of a dashboard on its head and turning this into an, ed, an interactive educational tool. So for instance, throw another prawn on the grill. Uh, that's anyway, cheap Australian joke. But if I want to say, how do I test this? I want to look for prawn. And we found it there. Or if I want to use this one, and you can work through these as examples to say, okay, well show me one or more not space characters followed by one or more not space characters. And what I'll see is throw another. So we're actually starting to turn this around to really kind of engage the users, get them learning about the concepts of, of uh, regular expressions, and then taking them that next, next step into an education and how to use them actually in the Sumo language service and with the ability to click down. So just to kind of reiterate what I said before, new operators mean new possibilities, start with an idea and explore it accordingly. And I'm going to kind of loop back towards the end of this session with something that I've done for a customer in Australia with a very security flavour which goes from bringing your data into one place to bringing it together. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dan. Thanks, Ryan. So for me, simplicity is one of the important differentiators that we provide with Sumo. This is one of the prime reasons I came to Sumo. I have many customers I've worked with of all kinds of different skills, um, and many just don't want to deal with those complex sims or log analytic tools and getting those set up, but they still need those valuable insights that those tools provide. Out of the box, Sumo is already very simple to use, as a lot of you have experienced. But you don't need to worry about the architecture or which specific type of collector to use on which specific type of data for a specific type of events or anything else like that. It's just a simple collector most of the time. But once the tool's set up, using it and exploring your data um, is a pretty straightforward learning process with minimal learning curve, um, especially if you've gone through the quick tutorials that I've recommended a lot of you guys to be using. But ultimately, Sumo is just a tool to get the information from your data. You shouldn't need to think uh, too much to know how to use the tool itself. You just want those insights. But this is especially true for certain users in your organization that probably don't have technical jobs and probably are like well beyond, not even close to technical at all, but they still need those insights. Um, but personally to me, things could always get simpler. So there's many ways to make Sumo simpler. And as uh, Ryan has already showed there, the search templates. But 
Um, those came out probably about a year or two now, and um, the options for simplify, simplifying your experience has expanded immensely. And I kind of feel that search templates sometimes, they're one of the most underrated functions in Sumo, even if they're very, uh, you know, they're very useful and a lot of you guys are already adopting them. But not only do they provide that flexibility of, uh, f uh, and dashboard filters, but they can do things like cleaning up a query uh, where building subqueries or uh, allowing uh, more flexibility with your time slices. The most common use that I've used to implement with, a, with, a, with the search templates are going to be when someone wants a bit more flexible of a where statement. As we know, a parameter on a search template is going to automatically be added into a dashboard. But currently, when you're using your dashboards and you're adding a filter onto there, it's just adding a simple where field equals into it. And that's pretty much the only place that I know in Sumo that's still case sensitive. So your users still need to know which exact case that they're putting into the field when they're running their filters. Um, but you know that could be a little bit cumbersome sometimes. And there's a workaround on that where you just convert the entire field to uppercase or lowercase. And you probably still have to explain them to them, put it all in uppercase or lowercase when you're running it. But how do we fix this? The simple solution, pretty much, is to just go ahead and use that uh, regex where statement and combine it with a search template, as we previously described. So the way that we're going to do it is, in your query itself, you're just going to do where field matches, and then you're going to do your regular expression, and you're going to encapsulate it with the, with, the, uh, with the forward slashes. And then you're just going to put a regex modifier, regex modifier, onto it. Um, by, by just uh, making it case insensitive. So it'll be parentheses, question mark, I, and that field is now case insensitive, and it'll go right in your dashboard, and they can put it in any way that they want. Um, but the next two were actually pretty funny when I figured them out, and I actually figured those out and threw them into our internal Slack channel, and fellow sales engineers, they were just like, like oh, that's pretty cool. And... Uh, some of our, our internal engineers were like, yeah, of course. You could put a, put a template on just about anything in your query. Um, but the first one that I figured this out with was with time slice. I'm sure a lot of you all have figured that one out already, that you could put a time slice in there. But basically, I had a customer that wanted to change their dashboard time ranges. It's a pretty big concept, isn't it, to change time ranges on a dashboard? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. But... You know, you could use bucket on there, but sometimes it's not the most predictable, and it's not the most understood way to, uh, of how it's slicing up your data. So they want more predictability around it, but they don't want to actually go in there and uh, mess, with their, mess with that query and edit the dashboard just to change the single time range one time. So what, they're gonna end up, what we could do instead is put your time slice into a parameter. So now when you run it, you have in your dashboard, you change your time range, let's say from... Uh, the last 60 minutes to the last day, uh, you don't want to be using the one minute time slice anymore. You're probably going to want to change that to 60 minutes. And to make it even more useful is if you're using the fill missing operator where you have to also put that same time slice in there to fill in anything you didn't have with a zero, you could also reuse that parameter in multiple parts of your query. So then you just have to put it in there one time and it's going to put it in there both places. And that's going to also effectively make sure that you don't have as much human error when you're making changes to these dashboards. Yeah, so um, if there's any product managers listening out there. <laughs> anyway. But, yeah, nice one. <laughs> but um, what about the subqueries? And, again, if some of you guys have been using those so far, you know that they're, they're powerful, but they get a little bit cumbersome right now to be using. Um, We'll go into a little bit more details in a, uh, in a little bit on how we could combine these with subqueries. But essentially, we could put a, uh, a subquery into, your search, uh, into a search template. So there are still some limitations around this. Basically, the size of a, of a search template field is limited. Um, I didn't think, again, like I was talking about earlier on, they, don't, they create this functionality and then once it's out there in the field, the sky's the limit for how we're all going to use it, including us here. Um, but there is an idea out in our AHA idea portal that I put in there for expanding that and adding a new parameter, sorry, a new, uh, new data type into our search templates that will also support subqueries. So shameless plug here, go out there and vote on it and say you want it. Just, yeah, just as a side note there, votes from you and ideas from you mean a lot more than votes from us and ideas from us. So vote. 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 
But out of the box, Sumo performs very well with very few adjustments, has a lot of you have experience. But there's going to be a few different uh, functionalities that, you, that it's provided to help tune that performance and create some optimal queries. This includes your partitions, field extraction rules, and scheduled views, and name a few. But sometimes there's situations where those standard capabilities just aren't enough. For example, if you want to improve performance on existing data that you didn't put a field extraction rule or, or uh, create into a partition, your, your options get a little bit more limited there to optimize those, optimize those queries. But in this part, we're going to go over ways you could potentially help out with that performance on data that's already been uh, ingested and you didn't previously optimize. So when it comes to performance, these field extraction rules are extremely powerful. They're essentially going to create a whole new field of data that, um, that gets indexed that's going to functionally operate like you would um, that you put in your scope. As you saw this morning with, with Bruno showing that the new stuff out there, um, it's essentially what, what, you'll, what you'll do in the future. So just to rehash what I said in the beginning, it's not these specific examples, it's just ideas to give you and think outside the box on here, or outside the docs. But with a field extraction rule, you're going to want to refine your query. If you want to refine your query down immediately to a log, you could do something like log level equals error. And you don't even have to put a scope or any other scope or anything else like that or a where statement. It's going to immediately do that on, the, on that field. But it's going to work like a keyword search, only better. It's going to give you that integrity. When you search on a keyword, it's looking at the entire message for that value. But when you search on a field extraction rule, it's looking at just the logs that even contain that field in the first place. So the problem happens if you don't have a field extraction rule on a field, which is probably very common amongst a lot of people, even those of you that are using field extraction rules. This is because there's countless ways you could cut and slice that data um, that you probably didn't think about when you were setting it up, or probably thought, like, I'm only going to do that one time. I don't ever need to do that again. But after all, it's one of the, the big uh, values that we're providing is that you don't have to pre-parse that data, and you don't have to worry about what it looks like before you send it over. So what, if you, what do you want to do if you want to have that performance of a field extraction rule without having to put a field extraction rule on there in the first place? Easy. There's two things you need to put in your query. The first, uh, this is probably one of the first things that, that I learned about when I came here to Sumo, and it's probably one of the first tricks or hacks or whatever you want to call it uh, that we did. So there you go. Um, what we have here is essentially a query that's going to be looking at some checkout logs uh, for, that contain the keyword error in the last seven days. Um, look into the query itself. We're going to have those checkout logs. It's going to look at specifically at our error. And then we're going to parse out that level name. And we're going to uh, put a where filter on there specifically for error logs. The scope, where it's checkout error. That's giving you the performance on there. It's immediately reducing down your logs onto the, the logs that contain that keyword in there. And then the where is giving you that integrity. So it's almost the same that you're going to be getting if you had it on a field extraction rule. Not the exact performance, but it's, it's a lot better than having nothing on there. Absolutely. So it's a pretty simple one. I'm sure everyone uh, knew about this or you know, was aware in some way you could do this. Um, but let's go ahead and make it simpler. Basically, again, a lot of this is about combining all kinds of different functionality to create some new functionality and making things easier. So let's take that exact same query and combine it with a search template. What we have now is we took that, that error field and we templatized it. So now all you have to do is you just put that in there once. Again, you have integrity and make sure you don't have human error when you're putting this in there. But it's going to give you that performance, and it's also going to give you the integrity all in one. Note that the data type that I put on there, or the input type I put on there, is an any. That's because if you were to leave it as a default of a string, it's going to encapsulate it in quotes. And it's going to work a little bit if you always want to have a filter on there. But let's suppose you wanted to just not have a filter. You just want this on a dashboard to always bring in all your results. Uh, you can't have a uh, quote wildcard in your scope because then it's going to literally look for a wildcard in your logs. So if you put it out as an any data type, it's not going to encapsulate it in quotes. And then you can put your wildcard on there, and then you manually put uh, the quote on your match on there, and then it will allow you to have that flexibility for having a filter and no filter, performance and integrity all in one. This runs lot, lots quicker. Lots quicker. Everything on that first line is what we pull back from the data retrieval tier. So if you can make that smaller, your search is going to run quicker. Everything after that's going to be processing it, less data to process, quicker again. Um, one more example uh, in the form of the simplicity previously described 
is a performance described here, um, as, long, uh, as well as using it with a subqueries like I was talking about previously. So yeah, it's a, it's a nice big one on there. But we already went over putting uh, a subquery into a search template for readability. This is the part where I was, I guess you could say, inspired to figure this whole thing out. Let's take this query, for example. Um, it's using a subquery, and it's actually putting it in there twice. Basically, what you have is your subquery on the top that's doing a keyword search. It's refining down all your logs and making sure the parent is only looking for a certain subset of logs. So you might have returned on the parent query without that one on there. You might have had a million logs you got to look at. But if you put your subquery on there and immediately refine it down, you might say that that's only about 100 logs at that point. You're immediately refining your, your parent query down to 100 messages it might have to look at. The second subquery is then going to basically uh, make sure, again, there's integrity on that. So is it going to be the same as if you had your, your subquery running as a, uh, a, as a where in your scope, if you had the field extraction on there? No but it's going to perform a lot better than if you had your, just the subquery in your where that gives you an integrity, but it still might be uh, pretty inefficient and could take quite some time to complete. So it's going to help out a bit. Little note that this is not necessarily going to work for everything on there, but if you're running any sort of queries or subqueries that, that are taking some time to complete, try, try something like this. Try to duplicate your subquery in there in your keyword and in your where statement. Just, just as a quick reminder, remember the title of this session? Sure, we can do that. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. <laughs> but it's sure we can do it. Sure. But the issue that we're running into here, obviously, it's pretty hard to follow. Um, and this is what led me to that next idea here. Boop. There we go. So to fix this, we're going to go ahead and templatize it. And um, this is what I was talking about earlier. We want to make sure we can get this into, into uh, officially supported for our product managers to, to want to get a new parameter on there. But basically, um, it's a lot simpler to read that parent query. You could build your parent query now. You could work on it a lot more. You don't have to worry about this uh, subquery that's also interfering with trying to figure out what's going on in your parent query. That subquery is actually now put into a template in there, and you just call out that subquery parameter twice in there. Um, actually, wish that I had included a screenshot of what I did for the subquery itself, but um, essentially it's going to be the scope that I'm putting in there, and it's going all the way down to compose source IP, um, and then you, that's a subquery, and you put it in your scope, you put it in your where, and then in your scope you also put keywords on there, and it should work pretty much the same across it. It's query inception. It's query inception, thank you. <laughs> now, moving on, let's go ahead and talk about making Threat Intel perform better. In this example, we're going to work with Threat Intel that's, been, uh, that's basically been used in a scheduled view. And then we're going to combi combine it with subqueries to get some context. So as you know, Sumo's Threat Intelligence is providing no digital charge to all you all out there. Um, but it's going to allow you to look up things like IP addresses, emails, domains, and about a dozen or so other indicators of compromise that you know if there's known malicious threats on them. It's a very powerful feature that we provide, and um, while it is a best practice to get specific when you can on certain fields, uh, sometimes you just can't. You've got to look across the entire message. You have, to, you have to bring in all that data. You have to maybe even use regular expressions to do it. That's what our Threat Intel Quick Analysis app is doing, is it's using a generic regular expression to find all these different types of data to compare it against our Threat Intel. Um, but essentially what we were seeing is that it could be pretty inefficient if someone just throws a wildcard on there and looks across millions of logs an hour it could take some time to, to pull in all those results. And when it comes to threats, you need to know those fast. Yeah, applying threat intel to three months worth of VPC flow logs is a <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> but myself and some other Sumo sales engineers, we decided to basically optimize this. Um, we took those, the, that threat intel quick analysis app, and we uh, created scheduled views for Brilliant Print all those queries. And then we put those into some dashboards. And some of you, have, you guys have used that. Um, it's called the Threat Intel Quick Analysis Optimize, and you can find it in our GitHub repo. But the problem is that scheduled views are not going to be providing us the context for what they find. So you could have all your results. You could say, like, yeah, I have 500, uh, air, 500 uh, 
uh, threats found here on this system. But if you didn't actually aggregate on certain results, you're just going to see a row that might not have all that context that you need. So this is where subqueries are going to come in. It's going to help us get that context that we need. Um, what we're going to essentially do is we're going to take a sub, we're going to take the scheduled view from, from the query. We're going to put it into a subquery of the original query that we use to create the scheduled view. I, I'm not going to get into a recursion joke here. Um, you know, I've heard them way too long. I hate them. So I'm not going to get into a recursion joke here. Sorry, bad here. joke. We're cool. Um, but instead, let's get into an example here. So back to that theory of putting a scheduled view into a, uh, into a subquery of the parent query of itself. If we run the lookup of these logs, we're going to see that it's taking nearly two minutes to complete. This is the raw query. Um, we're essentially, there you go. We're having our, our query that it's looking up against all of our logs. We're parsing out an IP address. And then we're doing our lookup against those logs. And then we're aggregating them. This is what we're going to take, and we're going to throw this into a scheduled view. So instead, now when we run this on our scheduled view, we're going to see that it only took three seconds to complete it this time. And while it's quick, it's providing us what threats we have in there. The problem is now we don't have context. We don't have those raw logs. A lot of times when we're investigating something, we need the, that raw data to figure out more information around that. So let's actually go ahead now and combine our scheduled view with subqueries to get the performance and the integrity that we need. Well, yeah, there's the query that I was showing you. So now when we combine them, we can see it took 25 seconds to complete against nearly 6 million logs. Um, that's a pretty big uh, performance improvement there, looking across all those logs to get all the threats in our system where uh, we put the, the scheduled view into the subquery. So what we have now, I'm going to click into this. We have the query that's looking into all of our logs. And then we're running a subquery on the scheduled view that's just going to reduce it down to just the, the subset of logs that contain um, any sort of IP address that's been found to be malicious in, uh, in any way, highly malicious in this case. It's going to feed it back into the parent, and it's going to immediately reduce it down to a subset of those logs. We then go ahead and do that lookup, and now we have the context on it. So is it as fast performing as a scheduled view? No, but it's a lot better than running it on uh, the raw logs itself. It took nearly two minutes to complete. So what we have is a query that took about 25% of the time as the original query. It's giving us that, that performance. And we're also getting, getting, the, uh, getting the context to further investigate the, the threats that are hitting our yeah. system. And I'll take this to a very practical level. <laughs> cool. So now that we've gone over some ways we could push this advanced, advanced functionality to the next level, it's time to talk a little bit more, for lack of a better term, about hacks. Um, this section just for your, for your information, is, is about expanding some dashboard functionality for uh, some visualizations and drill downs. But as you saw earlier today and, and yesterday, some of this stuff is going to be hopefully obsolete soon, where you don't have to worry about this. But essentially, what we're going to be doing is we're going to expand on the built-in functionality to give emoji and, and better drill downs on our dashboards for better visualizations. Both of these examples are coming from a very prominent customer and partner of ours, PagerDuty. So when my colleague Graham Watts and I, Graham, if you're listening, hi, um, we're both working with PagerDuty to bring them in as a customer. There is a team that really needed some better visualizations on their dashboards to catch attention and help categorize that information. The dashboard they had in their previous solution allowed this. They allowed, it allowed them to highlight the rows and, and show, like, you know, this is a, a red row here. This is orange. This is green. This one we don't care about. Um, we had ways we could do something like that. Uh, but honestly, like, our dashboards, they're a little bit, uh, not the dashboards, the, the table views are still a little bit simple at this point. So typically what we might recommend is, you know, have that table view and then have a panel next to it that's color coded to raise that attention. Um, but that's not optimal, and he was already doing something that works. And I honestly, I don't like changing people's habits if it's working for them. So Graham and I knew that one of our colleagues, Kenneth Barry, is wandering around here somewhere. I'm sure a lot of you guys know Kenneth. Um, 
we knew that he had this theoretical concept for putting emoji in a dashboard. We brought this back to PageDuty, told it to them, and the team loved it. Um, they said it's going to be perfect, uh, for, uh, perfect alternative to color coding, and actually one of the guys actually preferred it because he said that he would sort of paraphrase, and not paraphrase, actually quote, he said that I actually would like to put a poop emoji on there to label some of my users. Single value figure with just the Internal. <laughs> I've seen it. It's great. But you might be asking, why is this a big thing? Just go put the emoji in your, in your query, right? Um, well, it's a little bit more of a complex issue. And I'm not one of the back-end engineers. You can ask God about this later. Um, but I can't exactly explain why it's not going to work. So I'm just going to blame it on gremlins in the machine. Um, but long story short, emojis, when you put them into queries, sometimes they're going to work, sometimes they're not. I didn't want to have that uncertainty, so we wanted to make sure it worked all the time. Um, the simple solution was to create a lookup that has a ton of emoji. And it's based off of three columns. We have the emoji, a long name, and a short name. Long name, I actually don't know why I have it in there. I think it was just part of a CSV that Kenneth had picked up. Um, but basically, we're going to be looking up against that short name to, to, to bring it onto, attach it onto the rows and have it in our dashboards. Why is the short name longer than the long name? Ah, don't question don't ask questions? that okay, stuff. Fine. <laughs> Now, sorry. Uh, <laughs> now, when we want to use this, we're simply just going to look it up. Whoop, that one for power. There we go. Sneak preview. Um, but yeah, so we're simply just going to look it up now. And what the query is going to do is it's going to find all of our results. Um, and then it's basically going to do an if statement to categorize different values on there. And it's going to put, uh, like, for if there are 200, it's going to be a white heavy check mark. And if it's a 400, it's going to do prohibited. And anything else, we're just going to throw a warning on it if we didn't categorize it. It's going to put that into a field called icon. And then we're going to look up from our, our shared lookup file the emoji field on there where the short name matches that icon name. I should have just called it short name. But, um, but yeah, we're going to look that up. We now have our emoji on our field. And it's going to help us with categorizing this and, and make it easier to see different events uh, visually on here. So one of the final examples are going to be drill downs from dashboards. This is some basic, there is some basic functionality around, uh, right now around this, but things could always get better. This is one that I'm going to heavily owe to Graham for the work that he did on this one. So I don't want to take any credit from him. If you guys know Graham, he's awesome. He's not here. Take credit. I'll take credit. Okay. No. Graham, you get credit. But what he basically built was some excellent functionality that he worked on during this engagement with PageDuty. Um, to provide the, the customers, basically, again, they wanted this ability to drill down and didn't want to change their habits. But what Graham did is he ended up looking into, the, into um, different queries and, and how they would get shared around. And he saw in the query that you could essentially put the whole query itself into a URL. And when you run it, it's just going to open Sumo up with a query right there. So we also have a capability to take a URL and compose it into a clickable link in a dashboard like we see here. I actually think it came out around the same time. And if you ever met Graham, he was very eager to use this and excited. And I think it was just more of an excuse to him to, to play around with that mm -hmm. and throw it in there. But if you click on that link, it's going to, uh, on that search request ID, it's going to bring you into the drill down uh, for that keyword in a dashboard. So we see that now. We have it, have it searching on, one of the, on a transaction ID. The time range, you can't really compute it right now, but it's actually an hour prior to when that event took place. And we have all the logs containing that one in there now. There, we go. there we go. And so this is a query that he ended up building out. Um, basic thing you got to see here is that with a concat operator, he had the base URL of service US2 and so on on there. And then he added on the beginning time, um, did a comma for the end time on, on the time range. And then um, percent 22 to have it uh, the transaction ID in quotes. Compose that as a URL. And then you put that in the to URL field as search request ID. And that uh, was thrown into the, into the dashboard. So <coughs> excuse me. The previous examples are only a few of the different ways that I've worked with some of my customers over the years to provide them all kind of different capabilities on there. Um, there's many other one-offs that uh, 
customized solutions that I've worked on, Ryan's worked on, he's about to show you some as well. Um, but there's some others that, that other fellow SEs have worked on that's gone on to become fully productized and supported functionality. Two of the ones that I'm pretty proud of to, to be the catalyst for why they're out there right now um, are the Haversine Operator and Ingest Budgets. Haversine Operator, that was a fun one. That was actually, I had just joined Sumo and I was listening, I was shadowing out on a call, it's probably, I think yours, but um, shadowing on a call, hearing about how a customer wanted to find the physical distance between two points. And in my head, I'm thinking like, yeah, we have the latitude and longitude, we should be able to do that. And I started, gears started grinding, I'm thinking, what's that geometric uh, algorithm that I learned back in middle school? And I thought it was just something easy, and I thought that I was just forgetting geometry, which I forgot you it anyways. A beautiful mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but after the call, I'm like, I gotta figure this one out. Went to that cool tool called Google and found how, uh, search how do I get the physical distance between two points of latitude and longitude. And it turned out this huge, long, complex uh, formula called the Haberstein formula. It was gross. Yeah, and um, actually, I think I fed it back to Ryan and he ended up turning into this long, uh, long query that basically implements the Haberstein formula. Um, but I ended up turning that into an aha idea, and some time went by, and then our product manager at the time, she was, I guess she was bored, she was looking through uh, the idea portal, and she saw this idea for a harvesting formula, and had the whole formula and everything in there, she took it and built it out on, on, into an actually, actual supported operator, and sent us an email on Saturday saying, hey, I built this out, give it a shot, and I was like, that, that's cool. Um, but the other one is ingest budgets, and this is one that I'm actually extremely proud of. Um, had a customer that accidentally left their ingest, le left collection on on a development machine, and it just completely blew up their ingest budget. Long story short, things were settled, they're happy, but wanted to prevent this from happening again. So again, Kenneth had another idea. He said, uh, basically, we can do this. You basically just want to do a processing rule that excludes everything. Um, so I was like, oh, that's cool. I told him I could do that, but then I was like, wait, did he actually test this? And then I had the fun job going out there and creating it. But it was basically a script that gets triggered off from a scheduled search from the data volume index that then triggers that script. And um, it's then going to go ahead and add that processing rule using a collection management API to, uh, to exclude that field. Um, it actually became, um, you know, really liked and ended up getting fed up the food chain. And then uh, here we have it now with those ingest budgets. So you can all thank Dan Leiter. <laughs> But again, recommend check out our GitHub. It's going to be at github.com slash sumo logic. In there, you're going to find all kind of open source tools, but also a bunch of different projects that myself and other sumo SEs have worked on, whether it's uh, some dashboards that we built or uh, just some scripts like that on there. But basically, the biggest way that we could show the flexibility of this platform is uh, to leave the rest of the time here to Ryan to go through his fun uh, threat and tell customized feed that he built out here. Ryan? Yeah, thank you. Okay, playtime is over. <laughs> We've been very high level now, now we're going to go deep. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take this off. Right, so I'm going to tell you... Taking off the jacket. Yeah, I'm taking it off. All right, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. It's a very, uh, it's a real, real world story about using what's on the back of the truck to solve an interesting problem. Now, remember I started saying, let's start with an idea. Um, we had this customer in Australia who was looking to move beyond bringing their data into one place, which I'd say all of you have done now, you bring all your data in one place with Sumo, to actually bringing it together. And there's a big difference between the two, and I'm going to show you that shortly. That's going to leverage the scalability of our service, as well as the analytics we have. So we're going to use what's on the back of the truck. There we go. So I turned this the threat vault. And we're actually going to start where Dan started. This was around leveraging the CrowdStrike threat intelligence, scanning data on the way in, and for anything that was an interesting event or, or that CrowdStrike and Sumo Logic had flagged as a potential issue, we write that to a scheduled view. So that was a threat detection in one. And we'd actually write to a scheduled view in this case called threat vault underscore CrowdStrike. And that's important, and you'll, you'll find out why in a few slides. Now, this customer, they also used a third-party threat intelligence, in this case, FireEye EyeSight. Now, threat intelligence, you know, the, the log format's different, the, uh, you know, the severity's different, but there's some things that are always the same. Who it is, the timestamp it happened, what it was, so the IOC, the severity, and the category. The only way that an attack differentiates from uh, intelligence 
is intent, namely a target. So you probably notice between the last slide and this slide, those fields are all the same. And we normalize that threat intelligence down to these fields, and we call it threat fault underscore fire. But then, then the customer had their own security tooling. In this case, I've just picked on one of them, McAfee NPS. But this could be Imperva, um, this could be Zscaler, this could be anything that would detect a, mal a potentially malicious actor, source, destination, severity, and action in some cases. So in this case, I said it's a McAfee NPS, timestamp, IOC, who is the bad person, where, what internal target was attacking, and the severity. When all said and done, you have this. Now this is the importance of metadata at play. In this case, it's something simple about what do, we call our, what do we call our scheduled views? Because now, because we were consistent in our naming conventions, timestamp, IOC, target, severity, and category, if we just do a, a, a search across our scheduled views for threat fault underscore everything, we have every single threat that's been detected by CrowdStrike, Sumo Logic, McAfee NPS, and the intelligence being derived from the third party vendors. It's a nice place to start, bringing your data together, a central view. And like all SEs, I couldn't resist the urge to make a dashboard. And I made it black, because black is cool and black is security, and anyway. <laughs> and SOC analysts get scared of bright lights in an in a, in a operations center. But, but this is a nice view of a security posture of an organization based on the security tooling they have, the threats that are coming in, what's, what's been doing the most detection or prevention. Um, this has all been obfuscated, um, but this takes advantage of our consolidating our data together and our analytics to give a more wider view across all of my security tooling. Let's take it that next step, because now we've got all our threats and IOCs consolidated. That's what we've got. We've got an organization's own customized bespoke threat intelligence feed. This is every IOC that every tool the organization has is telling you, you need to be worried about this. This is a potential bad actor. And I'll give you a really good use case here. This was, um, for instance, um, another custom I've, I've done this similar thing for, they used Imperva to, as a uh, WAF, and they saw attempted SQL injections. It's probably gonna be by some script kitty, but their IP address was clear. Imperva said, no, I'm gonna stop you at the front door. But a persistent, and malicious, uh, someone with malicious intent, they're not just going to say, I can't get in the front door, they're going to go and try go around. So you're going to see that IP address potentially in other areas where your imperver is not. So it's time to actually start leveraging the th threat intelligence that that attack has given you, derived threat intelligence, and apply it across your entire data stack. And this is where the power of Sumo comes to play. Correlation for the win. Now, I try to keep this pretty simple. What I'm doing here is I'm looking across my entire data stack. I'm not even looking for security specific information, but I've actually created a subquery there. Whoop, there it is. That leverages my threat vault, reduces it down to unique IOCs because they're unique enough that they should pop up in that if you saw them in any of your data sources, you should probably be concerned and put that up across scan my entire data, data set. And, the, and so what this looks like might be something like this. Oh wait, no. It does look like this. This is the tabular view, and this is actually what happened with the customer environment. This was using that correlation rule, all IOCs, scanning my entire environment, and they saw this one here, the one with the big yellow line, ghost rat. Ghost rat sounds nasty. Hmm. I don't like ghost rats. I don't either. I don't like any rats. Eh. But this was high, and I just chose this out of the, out of the blue, just to see I took the IP address you see, or you don't see, over there, and thought, I'm going to take a look across the entire environment, and I'm going to be quick about this. Oh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> so I looked for that, we looked for that IP address, and what we found was in the Office 365 logs. Why is there an IP address of a malicious actor in the Office 365 logs? Turns out, one of their security analysts sent an email saying, hey, guys, you should block this IP address. <laughs> And I showed, and so this actually popped this up, say, well, probably be concerned about that. And I actually showed this in front of the analyst and 
Turns out he found it before any of their tooling did. So that was the email address, but the other interesting part of this, everything you see there, that was that IOC across every other data point in their environment. That IOC was doing stuff all across the board, and this brought that up. So you no longer, this is, using what's on the back of the truck, this allowed us to move away from scanning on ingest and do retrospective scanning. For every IOC that my platform, my, my environment has detected in the last 24 hours, scan the last seven days, because that might have been around a little bit longer than we know about, and in this case, it most definitely was. So this is what's on the back of the truck. Thank you, Vanguard. Security's on the back of the truck. <laughs> So with field extraction rules, we made it quicker. With data enrichment, we made it more specific. We could actually say, this is an attack and this is intel. With scheduled views, we made it quicker again and we normalized our threat intelligence. With search templates, we allowed the users, particularly SOC analysts, who might not want to play with security or consumer logic queries too deeply, to actually have a single field they could just pay, type in an IP address and scan across their environment. SOC queries and correlation made this all happen. Thank you to the PM team and the engineers for making that happen. Threat intel, threat intel, threat intel. Does a risk of being Aussie, oi, oi, oi. And the using the Sumo query language in unexpected ways and leveraging scalable architecture of Sumo logic to do this. I can, with some confidence, I can say other providers cannot do this. This scanned approximately three terabytes of customer data in 10 seconds. Because we were specific about the IOCs we pulled out, we threw it at Sumo, we used a scalable architecture to actually scan across the environment. I, I spoke to one of our um, PS guys, he goes, customers are, like security analysts are waiting hours for some of these things. This takes to that next level, uses what's on the back of the truck to create something that's truly useful and leverages the power of Sumo. Awesome. So, just as a rehash here, um, our key takeaways. One, think outside the docs. Just because we don't document it doesn't mean you can't do it. Two, build it. Everyone has excellent ideas. Don't sit on them. Don't let them go to waste. Give it a shot, see what happens. And three, give us some feedback. Let us know what's working, what isn't working. What should we work on? What do we need? Our product managers love to hear this feedback and it's one of the best ways we can make sure Sumo is a tool that you need. Rock the vote. There we go. So, thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, I don't think we'll be having time up here, but we'll be off on the side. Um, oh, we got some time? Oh, we got some time? Yeah, All right, cool. so we have some time, but um, if you guys want to, feel free to reach out to us through our emails. We're also on Slack as well. And for feedback, please take a photo of that QR code. We love to hear your feedback. In fact, if we're good, we get a prize. So, feedback. Good feedback. Um, any questions? Oh, one up there. I, I have actually. Yeah, okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have so a question. I actually have just one question. GIF or GIF? <laughs> GIF. It's not, it's not a graph. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Regular expressions, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvester. You're going to go scuba diving? All right, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, if you're running a query with a time range which doesn't uh, line up with a time slice, so, for example, you do last 60 minutes and you're in the 59th minute of the hour, mm -hmm. you're going to get these uh, weird anomalies at each end of the uh, chart. I can handle that one. Yes, well, there's can. actually, uh, uh, it was released earlier this year or maybe late last year, there's two operators called Query Start Time and Query End Time that allow you to filter out incomplete time slices. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> See? Right. It's not what you know, too, you know. Yeah. And so the other one is uh, full missing. Um, do you have any tricks around that for when you have null values? Oh, I do. But that's a much, much bigger <laughs> credit. That's, yeah, yeah. This is, I, I used Compose in unholy manners to make that work for the, the treatment of null values post-transpose. Sorry for everybody who kind of tuned out halfway through my explanation there. But yes, come see me. I faced that problem recently, so I'm the product manager for this. <laughs> and to be clear, he came to me and asked me, what should I do? <laughs> I came to him to ask for the solution. So our security team is actually separate from our DevOps teams, and uh, which is good, gives us you know insight and everything like that. Um, but 
you know, we recently saw sumo logging ingestion increase in our auth endpoint. We looked at it, and it was you know bad actor trying to throw a password list at us. Mm -hmm. And um, you know we security didn't see it. We saw it in sumo, which is makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as far as like our customers going back to their security teams and asking them for a post mortem to say why didn't you catch this? Is that something that you know we should be doing or that you would recommend or you've seen work? It's just Engaging security sometimes when they miss something can be really tricky. Uh, I, I think it's a that's a cultural question as well, <laughs> um, and you can do so just you walk in there with a shirt that says Des, DevSecOps rules, <laughs> where, and give everyone a hug, right? That's that's probably the the way I'd approach it, and bring them sumo squishies. I hear they go well. <laughs> not not to make a lot of it, um, but yeah, I I think everybody's got to be on the same page that you're working. You know, teamwork makes the dream work. You're all working towards the same end. And one of the trick questions I usually ask to classes that I kind of run the trainings for is, like, who in the room is in security? And I see one or two hands go up. And I say, that was a trick question. You are all in security. Some people just have it in their title. So that would be my suggestion. Good. One more question. Actually, one. we'll do one more. <laughs> Yes. Um, so let's say if you, if you're a, a bad software engineer where we don't use search templates and uh, field extraction rules, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any layer of uh, query optimization when I, when we go for a full search on a stuff? Like, do you do any of that yeah. aftermath? Basically? Yeah, that, that's and that's actually topical. Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's yeah. topical because um, yes, we have like it's funny because uh, you probably all know this, but the largest Sumo Logic customer is Sumo Logic. We have a look. We analyze our, our platform constantly for optimizations performance. One of the things I saw recently on the back end was there is a query that was created by the customer and a thing called the final query. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Anyway, um, that we wrote, rewrote to, um, in a manner to optimize. Now it's not perfect because obviously we're rolling out features, functionality, bug fixes, and improvements all the time. It's the great thing about being a SaaS. You all get to uh, kind of take advantage of that. But it is something that we do, you know, to guard. Well, our service, our other customers, and yourself. Great. Great. Uh, if you have any other questions, then you can talk to these guys offline. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. We're going to start the next session.